the mountain ranges and oak forests of central Spain are home to one of Europe's most elusive and secretive predators. As twilight settles on these ancient forests, they wake to a changed world of sound and shadow. the deadly game of detect and evade. The hunters and the hunted alike must watch, but above all, listen. The genet is a mysterious, graceful animal that's neither cat nor mongoose. Few people have even glimpsed it, yet in parts of Spain, the genet is relatively common. The genet slips through a dim world of wounded branches, a raider of the night. The late winter sun rises over Extremadura's Dessa. These Mediterranean woodlands, managed for centuries for cork bark and acorns, provide food and shelter for many migrants. At this time of the year, the world's entire population of European cranes descends to feed on both acorns and insects. The birds remain in family groups, and their calls ring out from dawn to dusk. Today's cranes have been flying over this wild landscape since the Ice Age. It's more reminiscent of Africa than Europe. And it was from North Africa that the genets arrived during the Arab invasion a thousand years ago. They flourished and spread very quickly amid the rocky outcrops and dense vegetation. Surprisingly large areas of semi-wilderness still remain in Spain, and it is amongst the tall deciduous trees and dense scrub of such woodland that genets still thrive today. It is rare to catch a glimpse of a genet during the day. In Spain, its nearest relative is another immigrant from Africa, the Egyptian mongoose. The two animals are very different. The mongoose has a rat-like appearance. Its tiny eyes, small ears and short, strong claws are better suited to digging out rabbit warrens. It is a daylight operator. Whereas the genet's bat-like ears, super-sensitive eyes, and an unerring nose are perfectly adapted to night raiding. The mongoose is an opportunistic hunter that follows its nose grabbing birds, reptiles, or carrion as it goes. It remains firmly on the ground. It's a fine February evening in Spain's Sierra de Gredos. The genets will just be stirring for their night activities. As a hunter's moon rises through the hazy atmosphere, a male genet scans the night sounds. He has a large territory to patrol. A moth is quickly snatched up, then he travels on. To keep rivals away, he may need to cover as much as 20 kilometers per night. A rustling in the grass betrays his favorite meal, a wood mouse. They do use their eyes when hunting, but at night their acute sense of hearing 
has a much more important role to play. In winter, wood mice abound, living off their stores of acorns. At this time of the year, they form around 80% of the genet's diet. They are no match for the predator's speed and agility. He uses his tail for balance. A genet usually hunts down and seizes his prey in one swift move. But sometimes he has to wait patiently by a hole for the mouse to re-emerge. Genets need to eat the equivalent of about six mice a night because they burn up a lot of energy. A neighboring male is also patrolling his territory. He reaches a vantage point where both their territories meet. He must renew his territorial scent mark. It will be a sign to other males to keep off. He secretes a pungent substance from his anal glands. It is similar to musk that is extracted from its relative, the African civet, for making perfume. Its odor may last for weeks. The first male, having finished his mouse, becomes aware of the other one and climbs to get a better look. He can see the intruder who has discovered the scent of another genet, perhaps a female, whose range overlaps with his own. He vigorously rubs his body on this rock to absorb the smell onto his fur as well as to deposit the scent from other glands on his back. The other male drops down to investigate. Clearly, it's an exciting experience. He seems unaware of his rival, but a confrontation begins to look inevitable. There's little contact, but a lot of noise. The arched back, sideways stance, and raised fur all serve to exaggerate the male genet's size. Ownership of the area is reaffirmed for now. Territories change with the seasons and the availability of food. Genets are creatures of habit, even to the extent that several may share a communal latrine over the course of many years. It's a good way of finding out who else is in the neighborhood. The genet leaves a scent mark as a calling card. These latrines are very often all the people ever see of the genet. Even to people who come here every day, like the local goat herder, they are the only clue to their presence. Antonio has been shepherding goats in this area for most of his life, like his father before him. And he's yet to see a live genet.
Yet, come nightfall, a genet hunts amid the patches of lavender where Antonio passed by earlier in the day. The spring flowers attract a host of insects, especially moths. But a diet of moths won't satisfy a genet. He's in search of much larger prey. It could be that the genet was introduced to Spain by the Moors to control pests such as mice and rats. They are certainly at home around houses and farm buildings. Their ability to invert their hind legs is as useful for climbing down walls as it is for descending trees. They are excellent mouses, and this skill must have been greatly prized before cats were domesticated. The genet is no match for a cat, so they were soon displaced. A rat, on the other hand, is well within the genet's capabilities. The rat's pretty large, about a quarter of the predator's body weight. A genet's jaws are relatively weak compared to those of a cat. So once he has seized the rodent by the neck, he pummels it with his hind feet, then takes his prey to a more secluded place to devour his catch. He's going to need all the energy he can get. It's early spring, the genet mating season. A female genet who shares part of the male's territory is now in season. Normally, she would avoid him but her scent is drifting downwind and she's been discovered. He can sense that she is ready to mate and seeks her out. It's vital that he finds her tonight. But when he does, at first she rejects his advances. But the mating season is short, only two days, so there's little time to waste. It is now that the sense of smell comes into its own. The male repeatedly sniffs the female's dorsal crest, a line of raised hair along the back that emits a strong scent which clearly excites him.
He'll continue to follow her for several hours and may mate with her several times. Afterwards, the pair will have little more to do with each other. If they meet again, it will be by accident. By spring, it is already warm, but the sun has yet to reach the searing heat of summer. Open meadows are still lush and carpeted with oxide daisies and vipers buglos. The grassland is a good hunting ground for the azure-winged magpie, which, like the genets, was also introduced. Portuguese sailors brought them back from China hundreds of years ago. A breeding colony have their nests in one of the oak trees. The wind brings a change in the weather. Sudden storms are typical at this time of the year. Ten weeks since the genet mated, and she's about to give birth within the safety of a hollow tree. It's a tight squeeze for her swollen body. The young are normally born tail first and emerge blind and helpless. Genets usually have only one or two offspring. She washes the first kit as the second one emerges. She'll remain with them constantly for the first few days of their lives. As the storm passes, unusually, a third kit is born. It won't be an easy job for her with so many mouths to feed. 3,000 meters high, the Gredos Mountains are still covered in snow, which will feed the streams and rivers throughout the summer. Only rarely will the flow of water cease, even in the hottest years. A family of great tits have nested inside a stone oak. They have lined their nest with some genet hairs from a nearby tree where the genets have their den. The genet kits are two days old. They are still blind, so finding the teat has its problems, but their sharp little claws help them to cling onto her and keep suckling when she moves, even when it's time for her to leave. The female hasn't gone on a hunting trip since they were born. Up till now, she's been living off her reserves of fat. Already the great tit chicks are leaving the nest. The parents have to coax the last one out with food. But it lands awkwardly and breaks a leg on impact. It's a plucky little bird 
and he's still determined to be fed. The mother comes down to feed it as usual and tries to administer her own first aid. But it's not a serious handicap. Meanwhile, the kit's eyes have opened, although their ears are still bent forward and not fully functional. They need feeding every two hours, but soon she must begin to hunt regularly again. It's not yet quite dark when the great tits see her emerge and begin to call in alarm. The adult birds are quite safe, but the injured chick is still on the ground and calling to them. The chick's only chance is to remain perfectly motionless and silent. The genet hunts mainly by sound. Unbelievably, the chick avoided detection. A road on a wet night is a productive, although often hazardous, hunting ground. For the natterjack toad, it proved fatal. Genets do not normally scavenge, but this female is very hungry. But despite her hunger, she cannot eat the toad. The toxic skin secretions that protected it in life act even after death. She returns to more familiar terrain. A garden dormouse would make an excellent meal. But seems remarkably adept at evading capture. Every night, the genet will need to catch enough food to provide sufficient milk for her three hungry kits throughout the day. Wood mice are far easier quarry and very common. At last, she secures her prey. She returns to the nest to tend and feed her litter.
Not far away, a tawny owl is raising young of its own. The owl does not pose a threat to an adult genet, but both compete for the same prey. A single large chick is being raised in a split tree and fed on a diet of small birds and rodents. The dormouse is out of reach within its nest. It's only at risk when it ventures outside to feed. Surprisingly, insects are as much part of the menu as acorns and other nuts. As the sun rises, the night shift beds down for the day. The goat herds are busy collecting milk from their goats to make cheese. They soon discover that something has been at the cheese during the night. A trap is set to catch the culprit. They suspect a genet, but it could just as easily be a cat or a martin. At three weeks old, the kits are not yet ready to accompany their mother, but they are getting restless and curious about the outside world. This little male is more adventurous than the others. He is determined to follow her. But it's too soon for such a young animal to venture outside. He's not so confident once on the ground and immediately calls to his mother. The last thing she wants is a clumsy youngster around while she's hunting. A new batch of goat's cheese is being prepared in a hut specially constructed over a stream to keep the cheese cool. not long before the night raider shows herself. Genets are wary creatures and are very careful where they put their feet. For the second night, she finds the cheese hut an easy source of food.
She leaves the hut as cautiously as she entered. It's almost dawn, and she must return to her den to spend the day sleeping and nursing her young. The identity of the night raider will remain a mystery. The goat herder's cheese has once again been nibbled. The azure-winged magpie chicks are growing well. Both parents feed them on a diet of grubs and other insects. Great care is taken to see that all the chicks receive their fair share. He tries out each beak with a caterpillar to test which has the largest appetite. Feeding continues all day long. As Antonio returns with his goats for the evening milking, the Jennet is preparing for another night hunting. The magpies have spotted the danger, but there is little they can do. Their mobbing tactics and raucous calls have little effect on the Jennet. They take great risks to defend their chicks, but it's hopeless. Only one of their chicks is lost. The jennet snatches it and leaves in the pandemonium. She returns to her nest to share her prize with her kits, who by now are taking solid food. Meanwhile, the villagers are preparing for a feast of a different kind. The celebrations start off at Antonio's home and then move into the town. farm is left unattended, an easy target for the raiders of the dark. The jennet approaches cautiously. Dogs and cats are its mortal enemies, but there is something here worth stealing. While the jennet is busy raiding their homes, the villagers are taking part in an annual firework fiesta that's as dangerous as it looks. The aptly named Torre de Fuego, which means bull of fire, is now a tradition in Candeleda. The risk of charred clothes and the odd burns to arms and necks is considered well worth taking to run with the bull. Incidentally, 
all the fireworks ignite at once. Antonio keeps up with the rest. The Genet uses all its agility to raid grapes. It seems an unlikely food for such an adept hunter, but the fruit provides a valuable source of sugar and moisture. She'll eat a dozen or more in a single visit. Not enough to affect this year's wine production. The fiesta is reaching its spectacular finale in the ballroom. On her return, the kids lick off the sweet moisture from around their mother's face. They're getting ready to leave the den themselves for the first time. They sit at the entrance, taking in the night sounds until the coast is clear. seem a little reluctant, but soon get the hang of climbing headfirst down trees. It appears from their behaviour that she has two males and a female youngster. The males are more boisterous than their sister. This is the only way they'll learn to develop their hunting skills. The female takes time out for a wash and uses her paws just like a cat. Their mother catches a low flying beetle and the kits rush up to sample the new food.
Life will not be easy for the family. Foxes, dogs and cats will be their enemies. If they make it to the autumn, then they will have a good chance of reaching adulthood. Eventually, the female decides that enough is enough, and it's time her kits return to the safety of the den. She picks up one, and the other two follow. It's now late summer, and the night jars emerge at dusk to produce their strange, trilling song. They swoop to catch insects on the wing. The kits are now almost as big as their mother and are starting to leave the den to accompany her on her nightly forays. They do still have a lot to learn. The youngsters are becoming increasingly bold and very adept at climbing. They appear almost fearless and willing to attack anything, even a metre-long ladder snake. It's not venomous, but it's still a formidable quarry. The hunt is more successful as a team effort, but this cooperation will not last long. As adults, they will lead a solitary existence. They're so alert that little escapes their attention. But it's wood mice that will form the biggest part of their diet, so it's these that they must learn to hunt. Insects such as moths are relatively easy to catch. Blackberries are a useful source of moisture and sugar. And it was presumably from these that the genet developed its taste for grapes. 
Members of the Viverid family, like the Janets, Civets and Mongooses, are unusual in their taste for fruits and vegetable matter, as well as animal prey. Janets also regularly eat small amounts of grass. Some prey items are a little more difficult to overcome. There's a definite art when it comes to catching hold of this one. The rivers in this part of Spain are full of crayfish. Like the genet, they are not a native species, but introduced in this case from North America. Crayfish brought with them a disease to which they were immune, but which all but wiped out the resident crayfish population. The American version is slightly larger and has stronger claws. A fact which the young Janet learns to his cost. The genet was introduced to Spain by the Moors over a thousand years ago. Whether they brought it with them for its mouse-catching abilities or its fur, we'll never know. It could just as easily have been a complete accident as a stowaway on board ship hidden inside rolls of carpets and other stores. However it happened, the genet is well established and here to stay. One of the most graceful and agile of Europe's night raiders. One of the last great wildernesses of North America, the cypress swamps spread over parts of Louisiana, Georgia, and Florida. This is difficult terrain for even the most intrepid of explorers. But for amphibious creatures such as the alligator, it's the perfect home. Faced with the prospect of extinction around the middle of this century because of overhunting, Alligator numbers have been steadily increasing since they were officially protected in 1967. It was in these impenetrable cypress swamps that the alligator escaped from the hide hunters. And it's in these same swamps that the alligator thrives today. The cypress swamplands cover an area of some several thousand square kilometers of flooded forest. This rich habitat supports an abundance of life, both predators and prey.
But without doubt, the top predator of the swamp is the American alligator. A fully grown adult need fear no other animal apart from man. Despite its large bulk, it moves with ease through the open pools and dense swamps. Its ancestors evolved in a very similar habitat some hundred million years ago. The vegetation may have changed, but the alligator hasn't. The level of the swamps rise and fall with the seasons. Throughout most of the year, the swamps are hot and steamy. The onset of the rains brings refreshing relief to all forms of animal life. Herons and egrets nest in the trees that surround the secluded pools. The egrets return to the same nest year after year, and much of the previous year's nest still remains. It simply needs some fine tuning. A huge female gator hauls herself out of the water right underneath the nesting egrets. For her too, this is the nesting season. Like the birds above her, she nests in the same location year after year. It's important that she chooses a site that's close to the water, yet high enough not to get flooded. She digs down into the soft, sandy earth and leaf litter, using all four feet. The rotting leaves will produce heat that will help the incubation of the eggs. An alligator egg is slightly bigger than a duck egg and also has a hard, chalky shell. She deposits between 40 and 50 eggs in several layers, each separated by leaf litter. She hides all trace of her work, carefully scattering the leaves over her nest. During the two months that the eggs will be left to incubate, she will be keeping watch from the water's edge, ready to drive off any intruders. During her long vigil, she cannot leave the area to hunt for food, but she'll grab anything that comes her way. The egret is far too wary. The raccoon is an opportunistic hunter and scavenger and a notorious egg thief. It's now over two months since she laid her eggs and the hatchling gators are calling from within the nest. But what's meant to be a signal to the mother alligator is also a signal to any nearby predator. The raccoon only manages to expose the nest 
and eat one hatchling before the female makes her ponderous appearance. The young alligators all hatch within a few hours of each other. They make their strange clucking sounds from inside the egg and after they have hatched. The young reptiles are less than 25 centimeters from nose to tail tip when they hatch, but are already fully equipped with a set of needle sharp teeth. As the female approaches the nest, some of the young hatchlings make a beeline for her. And end up straight in her mouth. The floor of the female's mouth is adapted to carry several of her offspring at a time. It just takes some adjustment to fit them in. Once fully laden, she gently carries the hatchlings down to the water and releases them. Slider turtles often nest in the alligator mounds where the freshly turned soil is easier to dig. They too benefit from the protection provided by the female alligator. The turtle eggs hatch at the same time as the alligators. The little sliders normally make their own way down to the water. Speed is essential. The turtles are smaller than a watch face and easy prey. While the female is busy ferrying her offspring down to the river, the raccoon returns to try his luck again. But already the little gator knows that its best protection is its mouthful of teeth, and it holds off the attacker until its mother arrives. The turtle hatchlings feed soon after reaching the water. They eat aquatic insects at first and then progress to tadpoles, fish and frogs. It will take them six or seven years to reach adult size, about as big as a dinner plate. The hatchling turtles have to be careful that they don't get trodden on accidentally.
some even get a free ride to the water in the alligator's mouth. Within a couple of hours, all the hatchlings have made it to the relative safety of the swamp. Unlike their parents, these tiny alligators are near the bottom of the food chain. But well below the hatchlings at the base of the animal food chain is the mosquito. Every day throughout the summer, countless thousands of these blood-sucking insects emerge from their pupae and wreak havoc on the warm-blooded occupants of the swamp. The aquatic larvae are eaten by a whole host of aquatic life, especially the aptly named mosquito fish. The supply is almost endless and the water teems with small fish. The fish in turn are preyed on by larger predators, such as the water scorpion. This aquatic bug breathes air through a tube at its rear end. It manipulates its prey with its formidable forelegs and sucks the life out of the fish. Anywhere you find little fish in such abundance, bigger fish will not be far away. At over a metre and a half in length, the river otter is a formidable hunter. Speed and agility allow it to pursue fish through dense weed or between rocks. Although the fish are caught underwater, the otter takes its catch onto dry land to eat. Otters are highly territorial and mark out their own fishing patch using scent glands under the chin. Otters are a top predator in the swamps, second only to the alligators. But only the adults. The young alligators are small enough to be taken by a variety of predators, and many of them do fall prey. In the cypress swamps of the southern United States, some familiar land animals have become extraordinary water dwellers. The fishing spider spreads its front legs out onto the water's surface to pick up any telltale vibrations of prey above or below the water. These hot, steamy swamps are breeding grounds for swarms of insects, and sooner or later one is bound to make a mistake. Although the cricket swims well, the ripples alert the spider.
it spins silk around its victim to prevent its escape. Then it can settle down to enjoy its meal. Beneath the water, the alligator snapping turtle awaits its next meal patiently. It sits with its mouth agape and wriggles a fleshy lure on the floor of its mouth. It looks just like a wriggling worm. It's enough to deceive this fish. Where there are predators, scavengers will not be far away. A crayfish picks over the remains of a dead mosquito fish. They're delicate feeders and spend hours nipping off morsels of food. The young alligators are now just a week old and need to feed regularly. At first, they catch small, easy prey, such as this field cricket. Prey is plentiful. Some they have to hunt, some they simply wait for. In summer, the lush swamp vegetation supports hordes of caterpillars, such as this hawk moth larva. They're often called hookworms because of the curved spine on the end of their body. Many are gaudily colored to frighten off predators. Now that it's fully grown, it needs to descend to the ground to find a place to pupate. But the base of its food plant is underwater. This is no problem for the larva, as it's adapted to swamp life and can swim well. But as we've seen, ripples attract predators. The young alligators are learning to hunt under as well as on the water. But down here, it's more of a hit or miss affair. And a crayfish is more difficult to swallow than a caterpillar. Although the female is still guarding her offspring in their waterside nursery, she can't watch all of them all of the time. The baby gator puts up a brave fight, but the raccoon soon learns how to get round those teeth. By the time the female arrives, it's too late. In fact, all but one or two of her clutch of four dozen eggs are destined never to reach adulthood. But while they're small, she'll do all she can to protect them.
At around a month old, the young alligators have grown to 30 centimeters. It's now that they turn their attention to catching fish. They soon learn that they are easier to catch in the dense weed beds where escape is more difficult. Their mother is still close by, but by now the young alligators are increasingly left to fend for themselves. One or two can't resist the urge to wander. A black bear cub comes down to the water to drink. The alligator takes flight. But the bear cub is no real threat to the young reptile. It's more likely to approach the baby alligator out of curiosity rather than viewing it as a potential meal. At five months old, the bear cubs are very playful and a real handful for their mother. They'll remain with her for another year or more. Until then, they still have a lot to learn. Discipline is very important at this age. The cub will soon learn that it shouldn't wander off to the river alone. A large part of the black bear's diet consists of berries, but as well as fruit, they eat carrion, insects, eggs, and rodents up to the size of a porcupine. In the animal world, the length of parental care is related to the number of offspring. In the black bear, with only two or three cubs, it lasts up to two years. In the alligator, which has around 50 young, it lasts a matter of months, although the female alligator will respond to the call of her young for up to a year. In the case of the fishing spider, which has 200 to 300 young, parental care lasts only a matter of days. She has carried the silk pouch of eggs for several weeks, and the resulting spiderlings now swarm all over her. She lays down a silk mat on the trunk, just above the water's surface where her offspring will remain until their soft skins have had a chance to harden. At this stage, they're tiny, not much bigger than a pinhead. They have to disperse over the water's surface to reach nearby vegetation, and it soon becomes apparent why she has so many young.
an aquatic or amphibious lifestyle is essential for survival in the Cypress Swamp. Neither the king snake nor the rat is normally associated with an aquatic habitat, but here they both have learned how to thrive. Both can swim well, but the snake is the faster of the two. The king snake isn't venomous. Instead, it kills by constriction, suffocating its victim and then swallowing it. As its name suggests, the water snake is at home in this environment. It's an adept fish catcher, finding its prey either by sight, tracking them down with its sensitive tongue, or waiting until it can feel one brush against its body. The water snake is neither venomous nor a constrictor. It simply swallows its prey whole and alive. It may eat half a dozen in rapid succession, maneuvering them into a head-first position before swallowing them. But as so often happens in these swamps, the hunter soon becomes the hunted. The snake manages to find temporary refuge on dry land and escapes the jaws of the alligator. But the next time it ventures into the water, it's not so fortunate. The egret has keen eyesight, essential for seeing the tiny fish it feeds on. It also has excellent hearing, but there's no mistaking these noises. They echo around these swamps at the same time every year. The bellowing of the enormous bulls can be heard across the swamp. It's late spring in the cypress swamp, 
and the booming calls of the male alligators can be heard day and night. They're advertising their position to potential mates, as well as warning off nearby males. The noises they make are at the lower end of the sound spectrum more or less deep vibrations that travel well through the water over great distances. These vibrations set the water on the reptile's back bouncing up and down. The depth of his call and the distance over which it travels not only conveys his position but also his size and therefore his attraction as a potential mate. Egrets are still wary. All this noisy activity is taking place right beneath their nesting colony. It's the female that selects a mate by approaching him. There's not much in the way of courtship display, but a considerable amount of nuzzling at this stage, possibly associated with the fact that the male emits a musk-like secretion from under his chin. Courtship may last for an hour or more. During mating, the female alligator may disappear completely under the bulk of her mate. Mating always takes place in the water, where the male's weight, which can be twice the female's, is at least partially supported. Mating successful, the female shakes herself free and leaves the male behind. At this time of year, the egret chicks are already well grown and the colony is a noisy, smelly place. It acts as a magnet to the local alligator population.
As their parents fly in with food, the chicks squabble over who gets their share first. The adult egret's crop is full of fish, frogs and aquatic insects. Repeatedly, the adults return with food for their never satisfied chicks. During these tussles, it's quite easy for a chick to lose its footing with fatal consequences. The alligators, alerted by the sound of one of their kind eating, gather in a feeding frenzy, during which any animal becomes fair game. During these bouts, the alligators will snap at anything near their mouths, including smaller alligators that happen to get in the way. Other juveniles know when to keep their heads down. But it's not just during a feeding frenzy that alligators become cannibalistic. Smaller alligators are a regular part of their diet. At over a meter in length and three years old, this young alligator knows it's time to head off to find a quiet secluded pool where there are no adults already in residence. This may mean trekking over dry land and through forests for several kilometers, during which it encounters some less familiar neighbors. The Everglades rat snake is longer than the alligator, but only a fraction of its weight. It's non-venomous, but its repeated strikes are enough to deter its larger cousin. Gator heads off into the pandanus palms that grow in the drier, sandy areas around the cypress swamps. This is the home of the gopher tortoise. The males are highly territorial, and should one stray into another's territory, a fight is inevitable. A conflict between two male gopher tortoises is reminiscent of a sumo wrestling match. There's a lot of eye contact and huffing and puffing each one trying to push the other back or even push over his opponent.
In a fight where the males are of similar size, the contest may go on for up to an hour until one eventually decides it's had enough and retreats leaving the local male to return to the tranquility of its burrow. It is while the young alligators are undertaking their life-preserving dispersal that they frequently encounter man. They often turn up in Florida's residential gardens, swimming pools, and even children's paddling pools. Human casualties are rare, but the household's dog or cat may well disappear. The local wildlife officer is quick to respond to the call of an anxious parent. well away from human habitation. the local residents aren't much bigger than itself and do not pose a direct threat. It is, however, dwarfed by some of its new neighbors, the manatees. These huge aquatic herbivores, they're often called sea cows, are now a rare sight along Florida's coasts and waterways. Overhunted, damaged by power boats, and more recently struck down by an often fatal respiratory disease, there are thought to be only two and a half thousand left in North America. These deep, clear pools also attract ducks and other waterfowl that come to feed on the weed and plentiful aquatic life. The alligator is never slow to seize an opportunity for a meal. Using the dense aquatic grasses as cover, the alligator moves closer to the diving ducks. Underwater, the duck's vision is not as acute as it is on the surface, and they don't notice the reptile lurking in the weeds. With luck, the alligator should live to a ripe old age of over 50 years and reach a total length of six meters. By then, it will be at the top of the food chain and unthreatened by any other animal, including other alligators. It's a tribute to the alligator's amazing success. But 30 years after it was declared an endangered species, it has made such a strong and successful comeback. And once again, 
become the dominant predator of the cypress swamps.